Hi, this is George Henson. I am the translation editor for Latin American Literature Today and a lecturer of Spanish here at the University of Oklahoma. And I'm with Achi Ovejas, author, translator, and Newstat juror. Thank you very much, Achi, for agreeing to uh, talk to me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, let's talk for a minute about the Newstat Prize and why you're here. Well, I'm here because I was invited to be a part of this uh, jury and to nominate somebody for this prize, which is a really big deal. It's a lot of money and it's very, very prestigious. Um, and I nominated Edward Stantica. Uh I saw that and, <laughs> I, um, and I don't know her work. I'm not going to pretend that I do, but mm -hmm. um, what I found interesting is one, that she's a woman mm -hmm. uh, and more women are being nominated and winning the New Step Prize than I, you know, I think we can say that about any literary prize now. Women are finally. It's about time, kind it, of it, is a, it is about time, <laughs> um, and that's one of the reasons for Latin American Literature Today. Our last issue was dedicated almost exclusively to women. It was about ninety percent women, but not only not, not only women writers, but women translators. Yay! Um, but also because she is Haitian American, right? Um, and I'm really interested in that notion of a hyphenated identity, which you share with her. Right. But you also share, obviously, a geographical right. affinity with her, uh, being a Korean writer. But she's French, or um, French Creole. She's or... French Creole, um, and she's black, um, which I think also, you know, creates. I mean, we don't have that in common. Um, you know, she sort of operates in the world very differently than I do. Um, I love her work. It's a it's a work of tremendous, um, you know, power, and it's a very um, it's a very moral work. Um, and you know she's a <clears throat> she's a writer who's seen a lot of very terrible things. I mean, Haiti's a country that's gone through a lot of horror, and uh, at which I think uh, talks about the Haitian situation in very universal terms, ways that we can all sort of relate. Um, her stories are deceptively simple, but uh, structurally she does some very interesting, fascinating things. Um, and she's just wise. She's a, she's a very, she's a writer of great wisdom and I admire her work so very much. Um, and she's also a very generous person. I think that, uh, you know, I worked with her um, for, you know, we asked her for a story for Immigrant Voices, 21st Century Stories, which we published uh, about three years ago with the Great Books Foundation. And, uh, you know, Edwidge gladly gave us a story, but also participated in a lot of promoting the book. And, you know, she's been always very open and very helpful towards other writers. And I, I feel like people who are selfless and generous should also be the recipient of generosity. And it seemed like an opportunity to say, thank you for your beautiful work. Thank you for the way you operate in the world. Thank you for, uh, you know, your wisdom, your, your guidance. I mean, I, I hope to God she gets it. We'll see. Well, what do you think her chances are? Gosh, I hope good. Well, you you know you have to be. This is a this is a process in which you have to convince your fellow jurors. Right. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure I know how the system works, but it's something like electing a pope. I think. I think so. Yeah, we were the, the voting process was explained to us, and it was it was very clear that there's going to have to be a lot of talking. Well, good. I, <laughs> I, I trust that you're going to be very convincing. I, you know, we'll see. I have a little bit of a cold, okay. so I have to like slap myself silly. Okay. Well, you're going to be, but you're going to be locked up. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe they'll give you lots of tea. We'll see. What parallels um, did you, do you see between you and her um, as a writer, as a person with a hyphenated identity, as a as a person who comes from the Caribbean? Or do you, was there anything beyond that? Um, I think we both um, have conflicted relationships with our, you know, ethnic communities here in the States. So, you know, I think to a certain degree, you know, we're both in love with those communities and at the same time sort of shake our heads uh, a lot at those communities. And we, and I think we both feel tremendous uh, sympathy for the people in those communities who come here uh, hurt. You know, there are a lot, just a lot of people who, from Haiti and from Cuba who carry a lot of pain from, you know, their home countries, and then they operate in this country not necessarily wanting to, you know, they don't come here because they want to make a better life. They don't come here, you know, with that American dream kind of situation. They come here because there's disaster right. in our home countries. We, you know, they come here because they're persecuted in their home countries for different reasons and in different ways. 
Um, and I think Haiti's has been much more violent than, than Cuba's. Um, but, you know, people come here with a lot of pain and then they have to operate here and that pain is invisible to most of the people around them and I think that's a that's a mark of both our work. Um, this is actually a very good segue into my next question. Um, we think of the Cuban American community as sharing a common story um, mm -hmm. but at the same time each Cuban American has his own unique story or right. her own unique story. How is yours different than the kind of universal Cuban-American story? Well, I mean, it depends on what you think of as the universal Cuban-American story. You know, well, few, I'm sure it's overly simplistic. Yeah, right. And, right. Yeah, you know, a few years ago, um, I mean, actually about 10 years ago, I went to a, a conference on Cuban-American studies with my dad, and it was really fascinating because um, one of the speakers got up and he was talking about Havana, and he, you know, he was talking about how much Havana had changed. He'd only been in the States for, like, you know, six or seven years and he'd just recently gone back and he was lamenting the, the change in the city. And um, then he started describing his Havana and my dad was sitting next to me and he was like, I don't recognize either of those Havanas. I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. Um, because, you know, time just changes everything in these ways. So it's hard to know what's, you know, what, uh, it, you know, might be the universal Cuban American story. Um, I think, Hi. Are you recording? Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> um, I think a lot of people think of, the, of Cuban Americans as people who come from Cuba, probably in a little boat, and you know they're running away from Fidel Castro's right. government, um, and then they come here and they become sort of golden exiles. You know, we tend to do very well, uh, at least in the public imagination, um, in terms of economics and education, leadership, that kind of thing, and all of that is true. Um, I came in 1963, so I'm a very early refugee. We came in a boat, middle of the night, and so we fit that criteria very well. You know, we did okay. We didn't do great. You know, my parents were both public school teachers, so there's a certain limitation to, you know, what you can do when that's what you do. Um, we lived in Indiana, which is not a very typical situation. Right. We, you know, we didn't stay in Miami for very long. Um, and so I grew up, uh, you know, about an hour outside of Chicago in a small town in Indiana. And, you know, I did things like go on hay rides and, you know, go to, you know, prom and, um, you know, with Americans. Right. Uh, with, without Cubans around. So. Which is very different than, for example, the, the experience that, uh, that Richard Blanco, Ricardo Blanco had, right. the poet. Yeah. I mean, he grew up in, or at least around Miami. He grew up in Miami. I mean, Gustavo Perez Firmat is another one who has a very Miami experience. Right. I mean... You know, there, there are different stories. I mean, the, the Cubans who grew up in New York grew up in a very different situation because there's also a historic Cuban community in New York that predates, um, you know, the revolution that was also very culturally present. And, you know, um, you know, Cubans who grew up in L.A. grew up very differently. They have a very insular community. They tend to be very economically, uh, you know, they do very economically well. Um, and so it just depends, you know, what you know, where you are, what's going on. I mean, in, in, in Michigan City, Indiana, we were the Cuban community. Right. We were it. I mean, there was one other family in town. They predated the revolution. They were economic refugees from prior to the revolution. They were, in fact, sympathetic to the revolution. So, of course, it meant that our parents could not possibly, oh. you know, really engage. You know, we, the kids, did. We became friends, but um, the, the parents never really uh, connected. Oh, that's very interesting. So, I mean, so my question was premised on something that is very simplistic, that there is just this, this common experience. But it's, it's, it's interesting that you said that your father's Havana was very different. Mm -hmm. I do think for lots of uh, Cuban Americans, um, the common link is their memory, and it's, a, and, right. but it's not a collective memory. These are individual memories of, and for the, for the most part, at least for a large part, of Havana. Right. Um, have you been to Cuba? Oh yeah, no, I, I've been literally dozens of times. In, in uh, 1999 I, I lived in Cuba. Oh really? I okay. went back as an adult. Because so many, you know, so many Cuban Americans do not want to go back. Yeah, no, no, I've been back many times and in fact it was an interesting 
situation to sort of, I mean, my parents were very opposed to my going back, uh, and uh, it, you know, it took a long time. The first time I broached the subject was in 1980, and I didn't actually make it back till 1995, so you can imagine the conversation for those 14 years. Oh, wow. Um, but um, when I finally did go back, um, and they were you know, still not keen and happy about it, um, they, a very curious thing happened, which was I, you know, they always expressed a lot of fear about my going back, and it, you know, the, the fear was always sort of characterized as political. But I realized that the fear was something else, which was that by my having more recent experiences in Cuba, my having an actual Cuban experience and not depending on them to explain Cuba to me, because I left Cuba when I was six, so everything had to be really sort of filtered through them, you know. Um, when when I ceased to have that dependence on them, when the kingdom of details about Cuba became mine instead of theirs, uh, it was a very, very sad moment. I mean, uh, I remember one time talking to my mom and she was referring to something and she mentioned an intersection and I realized that the two streets that she had mentioned didn't actually intersect and I, there was, I had like an impulse to say something and then I just sort of, you know, walked it right. back because I realized there was no point in no, saying absolutely anything. Not. It was, it was not worth the, the trouble to, uh, you know, to do that. For some reason right now, I'm thinking of, of Milk of Amnesia, Leche de Amnesia. Oh, yeah. Do you know that oh, word? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the uh, uh, Carmelita Tropicana's word. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I guess you, there is some, some degree of cultural amnesia that goes on in, in, in your mother's mind. Mm -hmm. These streets intersected and yeah, There's I no mean, reason they can't stay that way. Okay. Right. I mean, and, and also, I mean, why not? I mean, she'd been, at that point, she'd been away from Cuba 30 plus years, and she's not from Havana. She's oh, where's from she the, from? She was from the interior. They're, both my parents were from the interior, from different parts of the interior, but from the interior. My mom was from the central part, from uh, Sao La Grande, and my father was from Oriente, from a little town called Hibara, fishing village, about 2,000 people. And um, so there's no reason why she should be so incredibly intimately familiar right. with it. I mean, the confusion is perfectly acceptable, you know. In our own um, lives every day. Every single day, so why not? I mean, why should she have this photographic, you know, remembrance of, of Havana? There's no reason to expect that. Right, but, but believing, you know, fixing your memory is part of processing your past and dealing Absolutely. with your past and I mean, I think that's a gift that you gave her to let her continue to. to yeah, no, I, to I think that. she realized too that that something had happened in that moment because there was we both. I remember it was like it was in the air; you could just feel it. And then, and but it, you know, it made me sad. It made me sad for her because, um, you know, so much of her identity is caught up in being this person who, uh, you know, is displaced from this island and. To then not have a, you know, the this kind of detailed grip on the island right. is sort of like, well, what does that mean? Disconcerting. Yeah, and you know, who am I then, if I don't even know, you know, this very fundamental thing that's, you know, a part of me. Um, and you know, it was this was just a tiny little detail. It was nothing, but it was also everything. Right. But it could be like the thread that just begins to unravel everything. Exactly. And there's no reason to pull it. Yeah, just uh, let. Just. <laughs> um, on the topic of identity, do you see yourself more as a writer or as a translator? Or do you, for example, I don't believe in perfect bilingualism. Mm -hmm. I believe that someone is, is, is one language dominant. Right. So, but yeah. that also that, that dominance may switch depending upon which register they're speaking in, which mm -hmm. situation they're speaking in. Um, is, is that... Does, is that the same for you as a writer and a translator, or what do you see yourself as? Or do you see them as essentially two ends of the same thing? Well, I'm English dominant, uh, and I'm English dominant because my education is in English. Right. That's what makes me English dominant. I mean, uh, I have a greater vocabulary in English for that reason. Right. You know, because I have a formal, uh, you know, approach to words and language and you know, critical language in English that does not come as naturally to me in Spanish. You know, I have to sort of pause and consider some things in Spanish. 
um, you know, most people consider me fully bilingual. I consider myself fully bilingual in the sense that, you know, I, I really don't have any trouble switching back and forth. Right. But I do know, I, d I know that there's a higher confidence level in uh, my English than in my Spanish, and that has to do with, with that was my education. But you're a bitextual translator. I am a bitextual translator. You translate translator. both ways, and I that do. does not happen very often, especially no, in literary translation. Um, because, for example, you've translated Juno Diaz right. um, into Spanish, right. but Rita and Diana into English. English and, and I just finished her, her second novel. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. When does it come out? I think it's coming out uh, sometime this uh, spring. It's really exciting. It's a great book. So talk to me about your relationship with translation. As I said, I'm very interested in the fact that you're, bi -tech, you're bitextual. <laughs> um, you know, I've always done some translation. I didn't even realize I was doing it um, because my parents, I was the oldest in my family, and my parents frequently depended on me to explain things to them. And so, uh, by virtue of my education, you know, even though my parents are hyper educated, um, their facility in English was limited, right. especially when we first came. Um, obviously, they got better over time. But, you know, kids are like sponges. Right. So, I was like way ahead of the game, you know when it came to you know knowing what was going on. So, you know, if we had to place a call to Cuba, because back in the day you couldn't call direct, you had to you know, actually Go call an operator yeah. and all that crap. Uh, you know, if we had to get a particular kind of prescription, if we had to you know, uh, talk to a you know, repair person or a you know, utility person or whatever, you know, I was sort of the, the family interpreter. I, was may, I may have been 10 or 11 or 12, but there I was sort of, Oftentimes dealing with you know complicated matters right. uh, because uh, I had to explain to my parents and then explain to the other person what was going on. So I was going back and forth all the time. Um, at some point in time, I started playing around just personally with translation as a, just an exercise, just something uh, to play with, um, and especially poetry. I did a lot of like just trying to see what this would sound like one language or the other and going back and forth. Your um, own work or other people's? Uh, other people's work. Yeah, other people's work. I never, I never really translated my own work. Um, and, uh, and then what happened, how I stumbled into translation, was that I became friends with Johnny Temple at Akashic. And um, he, they have a, a wonderful series, a noir series, uh, different books um, dedicated to different cities, you know, and, and places. Like Havana and, Noir. Like Havana Noir. And uh, they were about to publish uh, Miami Noir, and he was very excited about it. And uh, I was at that time living in Honolulu, and he was in New York. And when the book came out, he sent it to me. And one of the things that I was really looking forward to with Miami Noir was reading all these exciting new Cuban-American writers. And when I flip open the book, there's one. Only, well, only one new one. Only one Cuban-American. Oh, oh. Which oh, was, wow. I mean, I don't know, um, I, you know, when in Miami you get off the plane, you trip over five right. Cuban Americans just on the way to, you know, to, to baggage, baggage claim. claim. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, uh, five Cuban American writers, actually. Um, so, I was um, horrified, and I called him and bitched and moaned. And in the process of that conversation, he said, well, why don't we do Havana Noir? Why don't we, you know, come on, let's just do that. And neither one of us, I mean, it took a little bit of coaxing me into it because I hadn't thought about editing. It wasn't a responsibility I wanted to take on. I had other projects, et cetera. And, uh, you know, at the time that we cooked up this project, neither one of us realized that there would be this translation component. Part of it was that I know so many Cuban writers who are so anxious to publish in the United States. And um, as a result, they almost always have a translation somewhere in their drawer. You know, you walk into their place and the first thing they do is they hand you a, an English translation of their work. They're right. ready, you know? And so it didn't occur to me that, that we would be engaged in any kind of, of translation. And in fact, the, the, the book, the cover, does not even give me a translation credit. It doesn't. No, no. it just is edited by Achille Bejas. When you flip inside, the each story will say if it's translated or not. Not all stories are translated. Thirteen right. of the of the eighteen are translated. Anyway, what what started happening is that these translations started rolling through, and they sucked. They were terrible. They were just absolutely aghast. And uh, do you think some of them were self-translated? Oh God, yes, of course. <laughs> and um, 
And so I began to do them. And also I began to realize, well, I want this book to have a particular voice. So this, the translation, the voices, I mean, obviously these writers have different voices and right. different tenures, but the book itself needs to sort of have a particular tone. And so I just started doing it. And um, the next thing that happened was crazy. You know, I, we went to New York to launch the book. It was launched at uh, the American Society, and, um, the Rockefeller Foundation. And David Unger, who I knew from uh, having spent some time with in Havana, David was, and he is, I guess, the director of the translator section of the Guadalajara Book Fair. And um, I remember on the way to the reading, Johnny and I were on the phone, and Johnny said, you know, we've never done a translation before. Are there awards or things we're supposed to send this to? <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know anything about this. And, uh, and I said, well, I, have, I have no idea, you know, but I'll ask David. You know, and I think he's going to be at this reading. And you know, I called David. David was really kind of snippy, which was very unusual. I don't know what was going on. And I get to the reading, and there he is. And he, you know, he was like, you know, I'm here. Um, and I thought, oh God, this, he's not going to be helpful. I wonder what I, you know, what I've done to offend him. And uh, and yet, when I got home that night, David had written me this incredibly long letter about what to do with the book, but also basically telling me that I was now a translator and that these were the things that I needed to do to proceed with my career in translation. I remember looking at that and thinking, oh David, that's so sweet, but I've got a million other things to do. It was a joyful thing to do these translations. I really enjoyed it. I, it was a tremendously fun experience. And then about two weeks after that, I got a call from a woman named Jackie Montalvo, who was an editor at um, Vintage in Espanol, and uh, she says, hi, um, David Unger says you're the only person who can translate to Nodia. Wow. <laughs> and I said, wow. <laughs> I said um, hmm, David Unger, was he drunk? Um, you know, I mean, no, not that he drinks or anything, but I mean, I was, I was so taken aback by this, and I remember I told Jackie, well, you know, Jackie, I've done one book, and it was into English, not into Spanish. And she said, well, David um, is convinced you're the person who has to do this, so um, I'm supposed to hound you until you do it. Um, and it, as it turned out, she wasn't inviting me to do it. She was inviting me to submit a sample. And uh, <coughs> I, uh, I remember I thought to myself, well, I'll do that. I'll submit a sample because it'll be fun to do this and maybe get some feedback on it. And um, and when I see Juno, I'll, I'll let him know that he turned me down, and it'll be something <laughs> in between. You know, because I was, you know, I was friends with Juno. I met Juno at the very same program I met David, uh, and um, we'd known each other for a long time. And anyway, so I did the sample, but because I wasn't invested in the project, I decided to just do something really funky. And I, you know, I, as you know, I did this very Caribbean, very Spanglishy type translation that sort of reflected back a lot which, of sensibility. Which is what he does. Which is in, what he does, English. right. And also, I mean, the translation of his first book, had, the both of them had been terrible. So, and I knew that, and I knew that he hated them. Um, so I was, you know, I played around thinking, I can do this because never in the history of Spanish publishing has a translation been in this kind of Caribbean, you know, argot. And so, and they're not going to do it. I mean, it's a Spanish publisher who's going to put it out. There's no way. Um, so I just did it, sent it, forgot about it. And then about two weeks later, I get this call from Juno going, girl. <laughs> 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 yeah. and, and so we, off we went on this uh, crazy, you know, process, which took forever. I mean, it, it was a, a really complicated event because he had been so defensive about the first horrible translation and um, he really this was his also his novel his masterpiece his you know this thing was huge for him and it had to be right and um, he you know and he also didn't have a way of checking it his own Spanish especially then was not strong enough to really you know say this is what's wrong here this is why this isn't working um, so he set up this crazy system where I would finish a chapter, send it to him, 
And then he would send it off to his 16 best buddies. I'm not kidding, I'm not being hyperbolic. Literally 16 people on that email. Um, um, and they would, you know, send him notes, which he would not reconcile. And then he would send them to me. Wow. Um, and, you know, some of those people were absolutely fluent in Spanish and knew exactly what they were doing. Some of them were not. Some of them didn't have any more knowledge of Spanish than Juno. Some of them had less. Some of them were extremely resentful of the fact that he'd chosen a non-Dominican uh, for this translation. Um, and uh, it was, you know, so you, I would get things, like I would get notes where, you know, one of them would say, this is perfect, it's, you know, it, it mirrors the original, it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then that very same paragraph would have another note on another, you know, a draft, I would say. Um, this is full of Cubanisms. It's obvious that this is the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it was this constant sort of negotiations between. But he left that. He left it up to you to sort all he of did, that out. Or he did. He did leave did it. Did he up to referee me. at any point? No, not. I mean, there were a couple times when I, you know, asked him very specific questions, and um, he. But he left it pretty much up to me. It was interesting post publication, how the story changed. Um, his very first interview, before the book had actually started getting reviews, I could tell that he was terrified, and he actually took some distance from the translation. And he, you know, he said things like, "You, know, you lose things in translation. Obviously, a translation is never going to be you know, half as good as the original." And, you know, and it wasn't exactly a vote of confidence. Um, wow. And he um, he said something to the effect of, "You know, the the translation is fine. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be publishing it." You know, um, but it was, you know, he definitely was like, I'm, I'm wary. I've had a really lousy experience with this before, and I'm not gonna stick my hand in the fire here. And this is, you know, a very different thing that we did. So, but once the reviews started rolling in, and the reviews were phenomenal, not just for the book, which of course deserved the wonderful, extraordinary reviews, but. The, almost every single review in the Spanish language press made a point of talking about the translation. Everybody had something to say about the translation, and everybody raved about the translation and about how it had captured his voice. And, da, da. and in fact, there was, a, there was one critic in Argentina who said that he didn't actually believe that Achi Ovejas existed, that <laughs> he was convinced this was a, you know, a, a nom de plume that Juno okay. had taken on because it was so much Juno. Oh wow, what a that, compliment. Yeah, you know, that he just, he refused to, to buy that this had been done by anybody but him. And one of the things that happened is that Juno started to believe that he'd had a lot much greater role in this. That, oh, and, and by okay. the end of it, he was sort of like, yes, we, we did this hand in hand, you know. And, and at one point I think he thought he was leading me. And uh, I finally just, uh, Elizabeth Taylor from the Chicago Tribune approached me and said, can you write a little bit about the process of how this came about? And uh, I said, this is a good opportunity to sort of clear the air about how this happened. And so I wrote how, you know, we had actually done it in his process. And the fact that he had, in fact, left it so much up to me. I mean, I have reams of correspondence from him saying, you decide, you know. Uh, and, and, you know, and funny stuff like, you know, I would argue with him about a, an accent on something that was wrong, you know, and I would say, you know, if you, if you want it to sound this way, then that accent can't be there. It has to sound, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then he would say things to me like, oh man, I just throw accents out like confetti. Right. Oh, of course. <laughs> you know, and I just thought, that's fantastic, you right. know, I mean, and so, um, you know, it was, it was a wonderful collaboration in the sense that he, uh, you know, really was open to doing it this way. I mean, it's what he wanted, you know. He really, this is what he wanted in his soul, and he hadn't been able to get that for his first book. And so um, that was, uh, that was sort of, you know, you know, having that license, having that freedom, and having him available was, was also great. But for the second book that we did together, I, I kind of laid down the law, and I said, here's how we're going to do this one, okay? I'm going to do it. If I have any questions, <laughs> I'm going to call you. <laughs> You're going to leave me the F alone. 
and uh, when I'm done, I'll get it to you, and then you can say whatever you want to say. And so we, he, and he laughed. He, well, he, he, you, you had earned his confidence. I totally that, had. And, right? he, and he said, you know, we've. Already and it wasn't a lack of confidence in you. It was a lack of confidence oh, gosh, in the whole. No, the no, whole, no, no. His he, experience in his translation. His experience had been had been not a happy one, and so no, I totally got what his problem was, and I, and and I also understood that Oscar Wilde was an incredibly important book for him and for his career. So it had to be, the Spanish translation had to be right. a very particular thing. I understood why he was all over it. It never dawned on me to say, hey, you know, get off my back, because I got what his problem was. Um, but for, it was funny, because when I said that, he, he laughed. He really, literally, it was a really hearty laugh. And he was like, yeah, well, we've already established so many things here that right. we don't need to have these conversations. And, and so it was great. And I just went off, did it came back. I had two questions for him at the end. He, you know, we went back and forth about one of them. Uh, and which book was that? Uh, this is How You Lose Her. Oh, okay. And, uh, and then we, you know, we called it a day. The difference, it was, it took Oscar Wilde six months to be translated. I did This Is How You Lose Her in six weeks. Wow. But, but you, you, when you, when you work on a project, and I've learned this from, our, you know, Prior associations, for example, you, you contributed to the queer issue of World Literature Today that I edited. Oh, yeah. um, when you're working on a project, you're hyper focused on that, right. and, and I, I just I just imagine you working twelve hours a day, shut up in an office. Or well, I do shut up in an office. But I don't know if I work twelve hours a day, but I am very hyper focused, and it's what I I mean, I uh, yeah, I I just really zero laser in and so it was uh, it was you know it, you have to live with it you have to that has to sort of invade your uh, every day which right. is uh, a very important thing which actually creates this tension between my career as a translator and my career as a writer I you know as a writer um, I have probably not produced as much I think I feel a little bit like Juno Juno I know feels like he hasn't produced enough um, and you know we're both kind of slow writers in some ways, uh, but as a translator, I'm like crazy prolific. And um, I mean, I've translated like 20 books at this point, and I only started in 10 years ago. That's incredible. So that's a little bit nutty, isn't it? And yeah. your your most recent one is a novel by Rita Indiana, right? Well, it's the one I finished. Oh. Um, um, actually, I I finished another one after that, a, a little biography about Frida Kahlo. Uh, who was the author of that? Oh, who is the author of that? You know, I, it is it a Mexican me. writer? It's a Mexican writer. It's coming out at University of Texas. Um, it's a really beautiful, sort of reimagined biography of, of um, Frida, and it's illustrated. And um, oh, okay. So it's it's really. Uh, but not like a graphic novel, but just something well, it has in some between. Very, it has okay. some graphic novel sensibilities actually. Um, which I think will make the story accessible to some people who might not otherwise go into it. So you've translated from Dominican Spanish, Mexican Spanish, right. and what else? A lot of Cuban stuff. Right, um, oh, obviously, I'm sorry, yeah, of course. Yeah, and um, I just did a romance novel for Amazon from Spain that was really uh, hilarious. So for Amazon Crossing. Yeah, for Amazon Crossing. Did I they, love those guys. Did, did, well, you know, I... I'm one of their registered translators. I, mm -hmm. I get the emails saying, do you want to mm -hmm. bid on this project? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've noticed that they're almost all genre literature. Yeah, there's a lot of genre. There's there historical lot. fiction, mm -hmm. romance, um, and most of them from Spain, I've noticed There's a lot well. of stuff from Spain. Um, and um, so I've, I've bid on a couple but didn't get them. Were you invited to translate them, or did you have to go through the same process? Um... I've gone through, I've done both. I, um, I was invited to do the Wendy Guerra book, which is the first one I did for them, uh, Everyone Leaves. Oh, uh, so Wendy Guerra was through Amazon, Amazon Crossing? The first, yeah, okay. the first book of Wendy's. I just did Wendy's second book. I just did a second book for her. I mean, Wendy's written like 16 books since then. Um, I did a second book for Wendy um, that Melville House is publishing. Oh, okay. But the first one was through Amazon. And so that was, you know, Wendy said, I want you to do it. So it right. was, you know, there was no bidding involved in that. I but I, 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 and I did lose, I, there's one I wanted to do very, very, very badly. Um, but I actually lost that to, um, 
to a really good friend of mine, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, so... Uh, but so no animosity, then? Oh, gosh, no, no, she's <laughs> terrific. Um, it was, um, oh, gosh, I don't remember the title of the book right now, but the, the translator who got it was Carolina de Robertis, and um, she's a terrific translator, wonderful writer, wonderful friend, so I had no, no problem. I mean, I was very happy for Carolina, and also very happy that, um, you know, she gets to develop this uh, relationship with Amazon. I mean, I find Amazon super easy to work with, and I, I know that they're the evil empire, but uh, for translators, I think that they're doing a beautiful, wonderful job. And also, they're a division that's mostly women. Almost all the editors are women. Um, there's, you know, actual human contact, I mean, with them. They, you know, you actually talk on the phone. They remember your birthday. Um, you know, well, they're at, they're all to well now that they're going right. to Alta every year. Every year, they're very right. present, um, and uh, they've just been really lovely. I've enjoyed uh, I've enjoyed every single project I've done with them. I just but this this romance novel was fun because it was you know there's a lot of explicit sexuality. <laughs> those are those are never in the yeah. in the snippets that you have to trans right. those translation samples. Right. right, and you know I hadn't read a, no a romance novel in million years and so I was a little bit taken aback with some I mean not shocked but sort of surprised to find this vocabulary and the erotic vocabulary of Spain is very different from the erotic vocabulary of the Caribbean so I learned a lot. Um, I might ask you a question about that and then giving us the signal that you need to be somewhere because oh. you're, you're, you're much in demand today. I see. <laughs> um, when I, for example, you know, because I've translated from Mexican Spanish, um, I'm translating a lot of Cuban Spanish now. Um, but of course, you know, we mm -hmm. come across um, we come across colloquial language, and, and in this case, sexual language, and you just absolutely cannot know all of these things. So I, for example, I have turned um, Facebook into, oh, yeah. and, 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 and you know, I'll I just. Find yeah, I'll just like say, yeah, exactly. Um, and if, for example, if I need to know something about Mexico, I'll say, amigos mexicanos. I do that and too. And amigos then, or, mexicanos. Or, and, you know. or amigos cubanos. And usually, yeah. Carlos Pintado will answer, or right. Norge. Norge okay. says hi, by the way. Oh, tell him I say hi um, back. I'm, I will see him at the end of the month. I'm going to Havana for... Oh, give him a big hug. Okay. Um, so, you, did you have to do that with Spain? With these, um, with this. a little bit. I less so, um, in part because, of course, you know they're they're the dominant Spanish, so right. they're actually in the damn dictionary. Um, you know they're easy to find in context on the on the web. You know you just plug in the phrase and it'll eventually come up. Um, I I find myself doing that a lot whenever I do Mexican Spanish. Ooh, I really suffer with that one. I end up going to a lot. Of, I have some cousins who live in Mexico, and so I. Find that they respond all the time. They're like very interested in what the hell I'm doing, and they're always like, ah, well, this, you know, right, I'm prima, <laughs> um, so that, so that's been, uh, so that's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. I just, I translated a, a short story by Miguel Barnett called El Moro, and Miguel's work is always full of very colloquial. I mean, because right. his work is is as much anthropological or ethnographic as anything and so some of these you know there's this character who's a Wajiro and he goes to comes to Havana and he becomes a Bugarron mm. and but he uses an expression something like no se me mueren o no se me duermen los los cochinillos en la barriga or something mm -hmm. like that and I'm like oh my god I have no idea what's going right. on in here um, but you know, sometimes you're dealing with stuff that actually seems very simple on the page. You know, just yesterday while I was flying over here, I got a note from M.J. Foster, who runs Translating Cuba, and she, she was dealing with a new book that's coming out called El Compañero que Matiende. Oh, I have that book. Norte right. is in that. Right, and she said to me, I have these two translations, she said, and I know they're not working, and so help me out here. And it was, you know, it's a, it's a mind-boggling phrase. It's very simple. I mean, one of the translations was literal. You know, it was the companion who attends to me. The other one was a little bit more finessed and said, you know, the friend who takes care of me. And it was like, and they're both so not correct. So how would you translate it? I told her 
I thought maybe something like the watcher who watches me because compañero is used ironically in that. Okay. Phrase, um, right? Well, exactly, but it's used in yeah. the communist sense. Yeah. Right. I mean, and it's and it's que me atiende is also you know right. It's, it's not. A, <laughs> they're not actually taking care of my needs. Right. They're they're spying on me. Right. Um, and so I gave her a bunch of, of you know I said you know this isn't this is like a tracker or a handler, you know somebody who watches you. It's not and and so it was hilarious because she had to negotiate with. You know, translating Cuba is this very cooperative sort yeah, of thing, right. you know. And she said every single story, uh, I think, every single person who's got a translation is translating it differently. Um, so are they, are they going to but, translate the entire book? Well, she needed to translate the title okay, in order to right. get... So and she came, you know, she, they negotiated something. I wish now I could remember what it was that they negotiated. But, you know, the phrase in and of itself... Every single word can be found in the dictionary, like immediately. Exactly. Oh, exactly. Exactly. You know? and it's and if you get it literally, it's not wrong, but it's wrong. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to be trying to sneak that book into into Havana at the end of the month. So. Oh, good luck with luck. that. Right. And on that note, we need to end. Thank you very much Absolutely. for being Thank here. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And Fun it's interview. so wonderful to finally meet you. We've been Absolutely. crossing paths. Many, on, many years. So uh, good luck, and Thank I you, hope George. that your, your writer wins. Me too. Whoever it is will be okay. great, though. Yeah.